Hi, Ben with Novolux Stereophonic. I recently posted a video featuring the VTA modified Dynaco Stereo 70, uh, where I experimented with different negative feedback values to improve the distortion performance. And I got some really interesting comments in that video. And through those comments, I did a little bit more experimentation. And now I've really got this amplifier dialed in, working really, really well. So if you're interested in getting the most out of your VTA ST70, some of the information in this video might be useful to squeeze just a little bit more performance out of your amplifier. So if that sounds interesting, stay tuned. The comment that really caught my attention on the last video was a very simple question posed by a viewer. He asked, have you tried to bias the VTA circuit at the stock bias level of 50 milliamps? And for a second, I'm like, what are you talking about? The manual for the VTA board says to bias the output stage at 40 milliamps. But then I went back and looked at the schematic for the original design and, and did the math, and it's obviously biased at 50 milliamps. Um, so I, I did a quick test with the VTA circuit with the bias cranked up a little bit and surprise, surprise, it performs like a normal tube amplifier. So um, I think this is a topic that that's worth exploring because biasing this at 40 milliamps definitely without a doubt drastically affects its distortion performance. So I'm going to start with the math in the uh, original circuit, how, how the bias is measured, and then we'll do some more testing on the VTA. So the area of interest here is the cathode circuit in the output section. So this is push-pull EL34, and the cathodes of both output tubes are tied together, and then they travel through a 15.6 ohm resistor before going to ground. And on the front of the stock ST70, where it says uh, 1.56 volts, you're measuring between ground and this side of the resistor. So we're measuring the drop across this resistor. So if we look at this circuit, if we just look at the cathodes of both output tubes, they get tied together and then they come through the resistor and come to ground. So we've got 15.6 ohm. And then on the front, we're measuring uh, for 1.56 volts DC. So if we do Ohm's law here, we've got I equals V over R. So we're looking for current equals 1.56 over 15.6, which equals 0.1 amps. So if we take that 0.1 amps that's shared between the two and we divide it by two tubes, it equals 0 0.050 amps or 50 milliamps. That's if both tubes have nearly identical plate current, you'll get about 50 milliamps flowing in each tube. In the stock circuit, these are the voltage test points. So when the amp is running, the manufacturers took measurements and said, this is what's normal at each of the tubes. So if we take a pin three of the EL34, the plate, we have 410 volts. And then the cathode, they're saying is sitting at 1.56 above ground. which equals 408.44 volts. So let's just say 408.5 volts plate to cathode. And let's take a look at the bias calculator and see where this puts the operating condition on this amp. I'm back on the Rob Robinette bias calculator page and I've got the EL34 selected at 25 watt plate dissipation. This is the plate to cathode voltage based on the, uh, on the manual, 408.5 DC. And then I'm going to use the uh, cathode resistor drop method just to reiterate the math. So we have two tubes sharing a 15.6 ohm cathode resistor, measuring a 1.56 volt drop, gives us 100 milliamps DC through both tubes, which equals out to about 47.3 milliamps per tube when we take new account the little bit of screen current that's included in that cathode measurement. So what this all ends up at is about 77% of max uh, plate dissipation, which is a little bit higher than the recommended hot class AB bias level of 42.8 milliamps at 70%. So we're in between 70% and 90%. And I think what this means is we're coming out of class AB and our first few watts are going to be biased slightly into class A. But apparently in the original design, this is where the tubes like to be. 
And after doing some thinking about it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that changing the driver board would change the bias level. The output stage is the output stage. As long as you're using the same vacuum tube, same transformer, same plate to cathode voltage, the, uh, the driver circuit shouldn't matter that much um, as far as where the proper spot to bias a tube is. So I was pretty sure that I wouldn't be the only one looking into this. And sure enough, on a quick search, I found again on the Dynaco audio forum, somebody asking this exact question, basically, why don't we bias the VTA board uh, ST70 at 50 milliamps? And Bob actually came in and responded that he said this, the VTA driver board is a different animal and has lower distortion than the stock driver board at all levels. I've already proven that claim to be false if biased at 40 milliamps. So it'll be interesting to see um, if the VTA board with the tubes biased to 50 milliamps actually exceeds the performance of the, of the original circuit. I, I have my doubts, but we're going to see what happens. And then he's also saying that you, know, you can get maybe better distortion performance if you bias the tubes a little bit hotter, but it will drastically reduce tube life. Um, and then there was some argument back and forth. So if you want, you can find this, this post. I'll leave a link to it in the description and you can read some more for yourself. But the original uh, poster from, from this, this forum post referenced a very nice article by Dave Gillespie on the ST70. And in page five, he goes over bias levels and it's basically exploring all the stuff that I'm testing today. So it was interesting to see that people have obviously gone down this path before, but apparently nobody's really shown it in video form with a distortion analyzer in real time. So. Let's take this VTA ST70, bias it up to 50 milliamps and see what the performance looks like. We've got the VTA amp here with the 12AU7 board, JJ EL34s, JJ vacuum tube rectifier. Plate is running at about 410 volts. My AC mains is at about 120 volts right now. And I've got the output stage biased at 50 milliamps per tube. This is a 10 ohm cathode resistor, so 0.5 is equal to 50 milliamps here. So let's take a look at the instrumentation and see how this thing tests at the hotter bias level. If you recall in the previous video, we could only get to about 15 watts before the amp hit 1% THD plus N when we we're using the JJ's biased at 40 milliamps with the 7.5K negative feedback value. So let's turn this on. We're uh, 7.5K for negative feedback here, but the change is the bias level is now 50 milliamps per tube. So again, uh, the uh, violet line is left residual distortion, the green is right residual distortion, and the left and right channels are overlaid. This is across an 8 ohm dummy load. So let's, uh, let's ramp this up and see how it does. So if we're keeping all things equal, this is where we would have gotten to before hitting 1% THD plus N, 32 watts. So obviously this is a huge improvement. Uh, let's see if adding that 3.3K negative feedback resistor gives us a little bit more headroom here. Yeah, look at that. So we've got, we're clipping a little bit. We're really at the limit of the power supply here, but right around that 35 watt mark, we're still below 1% THD plus N. And like I said at the beginning, this is now performing like a regular vacuum tube amplifier. As we hit that uh, rated power level, you can see the distortion here starts to drastically rise. And it should be like that. It should be fairly low until you get to where the manufacturer has rated the amplifier. And then it should be pretty, pretty consistent through here. So you can see the distortion performance is, is so much better than when biased at 40 milliamps. And the 3.3K negative feedback just takes it one level further. All right, let's switch this back to 40 milliamp just so that we have a direct A to B reference because I did swap to a different rectifier running the JJ rectifier instead of a Mullard here. So now we're apples to apples. The plate voltage has obviously gone up a little bit because we've lowered the current through the output stage. So we're now at about 422 volts plate to cathode and um, 400 milliamps is the new bias level. So let's repeat these tests. I'm on the 7.5K setting and let's see just for comparison where this ends up. So al already you can see we're around that. It's right around there, around 16 watts. We're at 1% THD plus N. 
So that's what you're sacrificing. Anything that's over 15 watts is going to be heavily distorted. Uh, and normally you wouldn't be listening that high, but this is important on transient uh, notes and things like that when there's a spike where the, the amplifier needs to deliver a lot of current to the speaker. So let's, um, let's switch over to the 3.3K negative feedback level. And I think this gets to around 18, if I'm not mistaken. You know, right around there, a little under 20 watts. So that's, that's how it performs at 40 milliamps. And you saw how clearly better it performed at a 50 milliamp bias level. It actually worked like you would expect a tube amplifier to work when the tubes are biased to that level. So now that we've proven that increasing the bias level improves the distortion performance and that giving the amplifier a little bit more negative feedback also helps, I wanna give this amp the benefit of the doubt and redo the tests I did in the VTA versus stock comparison video. So I'm going to flip this into the 3.3K position. So we're giving the amp a little bit more negative feedback than what's suggested in the manual. And we're biased at 50 milliamps and I'm using the JJ tubes, which were the best testing out of the ones that I tried. So this is like best case scenario for the VTA. Um, and let's, uh, let's see what it does. So this is one kilohertz at one watt, 0.02%. That's pretty respectable. Let's change the test frequency to 20 kilohertz, 0.05%. And let's go to 20 hertz. About 0.1%. So that's all, that's all pretty darn good. And actually, I think some of these results are better than the stock design. Let's take the power level up. I'm at one kilohertz. Let's take the power level up to rated power and we'll redo the tests there. Okay, we're at about 35 watts there. 0.7%, let's go to 20 kilohertz. And this will be the final test. I'm not gonna test a low frequency because we're running a, a tube rectifier in here and I don't want it to arc over. So at 20 kilohertz, about the same, 0.7. So let's compare the results from the first video on the stock design with this best case scenario VTA ST70 and see which one performed better. Let's take a look at how these amplifiers compare to one another. So on the left here, I have the stock design. So these were the test results from the original versus VTA video. And then these results here are what we just did on the VTA circuit with 50 milliamps of bias and the 3.3K resistor. So if we look across the rows here, we can see that the stock design won out at one kilohertz, one watt, and also at one kilohertz, 35 watts. And this is the most um, telling one here at how poorly the VTA compared to the original design when we're going up to rated output power. Otherwise, it did pretty well, and it actually it, it, it just beat out the original design at 20 kilohertz at rated power, um, and actually did quite well in the uh, in the high and low frequencies at one watt as compared to the original design. But the important thing to remember is if we biased at 40 milliamps, I don't think this would have beaten the original design on any parameter. I'm getting pretty close to landing on the ideal configuration to maximize the THD plus N performance of this VTA board. But one thing that I'd like to revisit is the solid state rectification test. So now that we have this biased up at 50 milliamps and we're able to actually get to rated power, I want to see if we have a measurable difference in distortion when we go with solid state rectification. So I'm going to go over uh, selecting the proper bias level because we're going to have an elevated plate voltage. We'll try to keep things apples to apples, repeat the testing and, and see if the solid state rectifier is better than the tube rectifier. So what I'm going to try to do is get it so that when we bias this up, we're at about that 77.2% plate dissipation with the altered value of the plate to cathode voltage. So we're gonna fire this thing up, take a look at the voltages, make a few bias adjustments and try to get into a sweet spot where we've got the solid state rectifier giving us about the same plate dissipation. So I just turned the unit on, it's warming up and I just backed these down a little bit so we'll see 
see where this comes up to. All right, we're still climbing over 400. This is fine for now. Okay, I'm gonna take these up to like 470. And we'll do the calculation and see how close we are. All right, so at 470, it's 47 milliamps, I have 451 plate volts. So let's try this. Right now it's sitting at 449. And let's change this over because this is different now. We're at, this is actually, if we're, we were going to do it this way, it would be like this. Oops, 10 ohms. So I guess that's still a little bit high, so I'm gonna back it off to around 450. I've now got the tubes biased around four, uh, 450 millivolts or 45 milliamps, and the plate voltage is at around 452. So let's look at those results. Okay, 452. And then about 450, 76.8. So that's getting really close. So after playing around with the numbers a little bit, if I estimate around 450 plate volts and we're around 0.454 or uh, around 45 and a half milliamps, it looks like that puts us right at that 77.2. So that's the level that I'm going to aim for and we'll repeat the test there. So with all of the tubes biased at around 0.454. I'm getting around 450, 451 or so on the plate voltage. So this is going to put it at that 77.2 or so plate dissipation level that we are running on the tube rectifier. So let's do the distortion tests and see where everything comes out. Okay, we're looking at one watt, one kilohertz, and it looks like we have 0.04% in each channel. Let's go up to 20 kilohertz. Seems pretty similar so far. Let's try 20 hertz. This is where I'd like to see some improvement. Give it a second to stabilize. Okay, back to one kilohertz and let's take this up to 35 watts. This may have an easier time getting up to 35 because you've got a little bit more plate voltage. starting to look about the same, around 0.7%. But it's definitely not flat topping the wave. Try to get right on 35 here. Right around there. Okay, that's looking a little bit better. Let's try it at 20 kilohertz. And this I didn't do before. Hopefully the tubes can take it. We're gonna go to 20 hertz while it's at 35 watts. Yeah, it's, I think that's the limitation of this circuit. You can see the, um, the waveform is not looking too great up there. Uh, if we just take the amplitude and come down until it cleans up, let's see where that's at. It also could be frequency related. That's starting to look better there. Let's see where we're at. So kind of similar to the, uh, the 20 kilohertz level. So all in all, let's compare this and, and see if the solid state rectifier did any better than the tube rectifier.
So what we found here is kind of interesting. And my main takeaway is this data would be much better to look at graphed um, over a set of frequencies on a sweep than just comparing a few levels because these results are kind of inconclusive. But what I can, uh, what I can say is that when we're looking at the 50 milliamp bias tube rectifier, it did better in the one watt range. Uh, kind of across the board. When we went to the solid state rectifier with the slightly lower bias level to compensate, it did really well in the 20 hertz region compared to the solid, or the tube rectifier, but it didn't uh, really even come, come close to the results of the tube rectifier at 50 milliamps. Now, when we go to the maximum output power, we got a little bit more performance out of the solid state rectifier, probably because we had elevated B+. So I'm not sure it's quite worth the, um, the trade-off going to the solid state rectifier besides uh, giving yourself a little extra reli reliability because sometimes the tube rectifiers in these can arc over, especially uh, the current production one. So there's a little mod that can be put in uh, with some diodes to protect the tube rectifier. But I'm still not seeing a conclusive uh, connection here that would suggest the solid state rectifier is the better choice for this amp. So for right now, I think I've got it optimized with tube rectifier, 50 milliamp bias, give it more negative feedback and use a good set of output tubes. And, and then it performs like a, a regular tube amplifier. Thank you so much for coming by the channel to check out this video on the VTA modified Dynaco Stereo 70. I think I've got this amplifier to a really good place performance wise, but THD plus N does not mean everything. And I think some listening tests are in order on this piece. So what I've decided to do is kind of duplicate what I did on the original versus VTA comparison. Take this over to a friend's house, get a bunch of audio files together and listen to this thing and compare the two negative feedback levels, solid state versus tube rectification, and maybe even trout versus ultra linear. So stay tuned for that. I'll do that in a separate video. Until then, thanks again for coming by the channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.